Hello and uh, welcome everyone. This is our week two live cast for uh, our hands-on session, our lab uh, class that would be that would be our traditional lab session in a traditional face-to-face -face class. I hope everyone is happy and well and safe wherever you are, wherever you're joining us. Now, a couple of uh, notes. Uh, you can, of course, comment here on uh, YouTube Live in the comment box. They're a little bit tricky for me to see as I'm talking, um, but we'll, we'll try and keep an eye of them as will the IAs. But there is a link, as you'll see in the comments, the comments on the side here that uh, link to a Piazza thread. So if you can uh, please post your comments in the Piazza thread, it'll be much easier for the IAs to see and to bring uh, to my attention and for me to see and of course to give this kind of threaded feedback if we just keep it all in the on the YouTube comments what we'll see is you know they'll just fly by and we'll maybe miss a question that was given to a particular section because we've moved on and and we go too fast so it's it's quite difficult for me to get a sense of how fast to go how slow to go but you can please uh, let, let us know either through the piazza or here on the comment section whatever whatever you can get to at the at the time and we'll 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 improve our process as we go through and do more of them this is my first time broadcasting through this mechanism the reason we're doing it here rather than a, a zoom session is zoom has got pretty painful lately and has also had a, a number of issues with it in some other classes that we don't want to replicate here and you know we want to make a welcoming environment we don't want anyone to be exposed to unfortunate images or any of the other sorts of things that have been happening sometimes in some other classes. So this is our mechanism. If it doesn't work for you or it, uh, you prefer to go to Zoom, let us know again in that, in that Piazza form and we'll switch. We have the ability to switch up. So let's get started. This is um, our hands-on session for week two. So please, if you can go to our uh, class website, of course, click on the schedule where we have our schedule of, of classes, our weekly content. And then we're obviously on week two. So if you can find that welcome to bioinformatics uh, class and click on that, you'll get to our week two content. And here I'm zoomed in a little bit. So I'm gonna scroll down here and I'm gonna find our lab handout, handout our kind of worksheet. This is a PDF. So when you click on this, depending on upon the browser you're using, I'm using uh, uh, Chrome here. I'll sometimes switch over to other browsers just to show you occasionally that things look different in different web browsers and sometimes work better in one web browser than another. But here in my Chrome browser, it's opened it in the browser. I want to download it. Maybe your browser's already done that and you'll find it in your downloads folder. If not, if like me, I'm going to click on this little button here to download it. The reason I'm doing that is this PDF has is a form. It's got fillable fields in it that you can add your answers to different questions and your comments and things like that. We're actually going to submit this to uh, Gradescope. We'll show you that a little bit later on. Okay, so please download this. Uh, what we'll find is, as you'll read through it, uh, there are four major sections to this lab. The, the, they're they're kind of listed here. And if we were doing this traditionally or the way I would suggest you do it, you know, when you kind of look at this on your own, it'll take you a little bit longer because it's newer to you, right? It's, it's, these are new, in this case, web resources, major bioinformatics resource providers that we're going to visit. And uh, it would typically take you these sorts of time. And I suggest you structure it a bit like this. This is how I would structure it in the classroom as we were going through it together. And oh, how I wish that was the case that we could all be together and, and uh, do this in a traditional way. But, you know, Life is not like that right at the minute, so we're going to do it slightly different. I'm going to again suggest, you know, if you are going to do future labs that you work through in this kind of way, you know, take breaks, go do something that makes you happy if this lab isn't making you happy, but stick with it. You know, it's, it's how you respond to these things that defines success in this class. For today, this would be a bit painful if I talk at you for 35 minutes. I realize that I can't even stand my own voice for 35 minutes coming back at me on this system here so what i suggest we do is we're going to break it down and go a little bit more quickly so i'm going to kind of review these sections right so i'm going to spend no more than it'll probably be closer to 10 minutes on each section but i'm allotting 15 minutes here and then i'm going to take a five minute break between them where i'll uh, try and find the questions and the comments that people have been 
I've been posting if I miss them as I'm talking because I'm not good at multitasking, okay? But we'll, we'll take a little five minute break and ask questions and we'll, I'll both respond vocally through this mechanism and read them out and try and type as well if that's not too distracting for you. We'll see how it works. So we're gonna spend around 10 to 15 minutes on each of these four major sections with a you know, give or take five minute break or time to go get a cup of coffee or, or whatever between these uh, sections, okay? All right, wish us luck, let's, let's give it a go. I'm gonna go over to um, a different screen here. And so I've already downloaded the lab PDF. So here I am, I have the PDF open in my PDF viewer. I'm on a Mac in this case, but I have a PC I can show you later. It's just a PDF window. So let me bring my mouse. So actually that's not the right one. So I'll do it again. Uh, here I'm going to go, this is our class website, I'm going to take the lab hands-on session. Here it is, I'm going to download it. I'm going to save it, well I'll just save it to my downloads folder. And then replace that one, make sure I've got the right one. And it should uh, open up, let me go in and go to that right over here. Okay, so here's the PDF, hopefully you can see that, and I'll bring it here too. So there's a section to write your name, your student number, those sorts of things, all in this, all in this window. I'm going to go back here and make sure that, oh, yeah, let me do one thing. Bring this here. And now I'll be set, sorry, getting myself sorted with all the multiple windows here. So I don't need this window anymore. I'm gonna close it. I'm gonna go up to my PDF. So uh, in the PDF here, you know, it's got a little bit of a, a, a side note in it in saying that, you know, the web, this online, uh, interfaces that we're using for this week's class. We're going to move more to uh, mathematics programming and, and scripting and doing stuff kind of in a more uh, robust way next week. But here we're still using kind of online resources and online tools primarily. But the web is a dynamic environment and stuff changes and web pages move uh, content around and the styles of them changes and all sorts of things like that. So if you're watching this video in a in a, at a later time and maybe you can't find the link that I click on right now uh, or it's it's documented here in the lab sheet it's because you know things change that some designer has changed the style of it it'll still be there the major content will always be there it just might you might have to hunt around for it uh, a little bit more so do try and be kind of stubborn and persistent and try and find what we're talking about so here the, the general idea with this lab is we're going to go and I'm going to lead you through some of these major bioinformatics resources that we talked about in the week two video lectures. So those are ones at NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information that's in the US outside uh, Washington DC in a place called Bethesda that's based physically. And then there's one over outside Cambridge in the UK that's called the European Bioinformatics Institute. And they have a lot of tools and resources that are both complementary but also extend on some of those that aren't available at NCBI. That's why we're going to use both in this lab. Okay, so in section one it says this transcript, this thing in blue here, this sequence, was found in a human patient's blood. Okay, it was extracted in a hospital and it was found to be very abundant in the blood sample. So this is a sequence as you can see and it's got A, T's and G's and C's, so guess what? type of sequence it is, right? It's a nucleotide sequence in this case. And it's in a particular format. See, it has this little, let me see if I can uh, zoom in a little bit more here on this. So it has, yes, yeah, so it has this little more than symbol and it's called example one right here, okay? So this is a format that we'll see over and over again, it's called FASTA format. We'll hit on it quite a few times in our, in our course, but it's one of the most simple formats for storing sequence data. All it has is a name, 
with that follows this little more than symbol and then it has the sequence and it just continues on until the end of the file or until it hits another more than sign and another sequence another name that's how the bioinformatics programs that read these things know that you have multiple sequences for example so this is the only kind of information we've got about this sequence here so this is the the little more than symbol and the name and then the sequence just keeps on going it keeps on going and it says the only information we've got is the sequence what is it all right so we're going to start by being a bit of a detective and saying well what can we find out about this sequence so i'm going to copy it all including the little uh, identifier line in this fasta format so i'm going to copy it i'm going to uh, control c or if you're on a mac command c to copy that onto the clipboard and then it tells me here in the workbook uh, go to blast right ncbi blast web server so if you can see where my mouse is i'm clicking on this link and we'll go over to our web uh, page here back to the, the big screen here and this has opened up a web page and i'll bring this out in a separate tab so we don't have any thing distracting us here and close these ones and what we're going to do here with Blast, I'll make this a little larger, is we have to decide, first off, which version of this program do we use? So what Blast is, is it's an alignment tool. Next week, we're going to learn oh, how about this works. It's, it's a very common approach that we use in bioinformatics all the time, not just for searching databases like today, but for pretty much all next generation sequencing analysis. We have to align reads to a reference genome or do we sequencing or any of these things we're going to do an alignment of sorts so it's a great place to start understanding how these things work under the hood so we'll do that next week how the algorithm works the computational kind of recipe that allows us to do this but for now we're going to take a much more practical approach and we're going to say well what are we going to do with this sequence so the first thing is which version of blast do we use and in fact in the workbook it asks you that, right? If I go back to the, the workbook here for a second, it says, ask program should we use in this case? And there's a hint in green that says, what type of sequence are you provided with? So in this case, I've already told you, it's a nucleotide sequence. So we're gonna pick back over here on the website, we're gonna pick one of these uh, resources and we're gonna pick nucleotide blast because we're searching with a nucleotide sequence against a nucleotide database okay if we had a protein sequence or other things we'd pick one of these other variants of this blast tool so let's pick nucleotide blast this will bring us to a submission page and you know as uh, it's got this covid19 or corona virus banner in the top that we can't turn off we can't get away from it anywhere even in class right this 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 stuff but we're going to focus here on running this program which is called blast Ed. you see the different tabs here up at the top if you can see where my mouse is up here blast N. that's for bl the nucleotide blast if you had a clicked protein blast it would have took you to the second tab blast p so the answer for that first question is blast n that's nucleotide blast so i'm going to write that in the workbook blast n which is nucleotide blast And I'm actually going to remember to write my name on this just in case up at the top up here so I'm Barry I don't have a student number but this is the number you know on your university card the one that you would enter in when you do uh, you know assignments and various other things that you the number that comes around with you I'm just gonna call for help right that's, that's my number okay so we've got our first question answered we still have to do this so what we're going to do here is search against the nucleotide collection that's called the nr database this includes genbank the main ncbi repository of of uh, gene sequences of nucleotide sequences and that's a good place to start so we're going to take that fasta sequence that's on my clipboard and paste it in to this box right a bit like you know an email online email thing there's fields that we can fill in i'm just going to do Control v or command v it's pasted in it looks a little funny 
here because of my zoom level for this web page I'm just I can drag this box just to make sure it looks correct and I should see that it's a faster sequence it's got that little more than symbol and it's got the sequence itself and no other funny characters or something else that was on my clipboard or you know because then it wouldn't it wouldn't work right um, so if I scroll down here I see in the database side right here it says pick your database so we can search against different databases there's a big list of different ones including RefSeq remember the best reference sequence the the non-redundant version of, of GenBank here but I'm going to keep it as nucleotide collection so search against everything because I want to see if there's any hits out there and there's also options we could limit this to humans because obviously we have a human patient here I'm not going to bother just for this first search you could give it a job title example one is it that's what uh, comes from the FASTA you know the thing that we pasted in the box above the FASTA title here so I'm going to keep that as is and I'm just going to click blast this is the big button down the bottom that says that says blast on it right here so I'm going to click that and I've, I'll also then okay so relatively quickly and um, you know I'm my internet is being abused by children watching all sorts of stuff at the minute to keep them quiet on the TV so it might be a little slow for me but I've already got my search results here so this is the results of pasting that sequence in and searching with it as a query against this uh, what we call the NR database as we'll see or the NT the nucleotide collection so if the first thing that's displayed here if you scroll down it tells you the job title now that was user defined I just left it as is that came from the FASTA title of the sequence that we pasted in we could have changed this it has a thing called RID this is the reference identifier so if you ever want to get back to these search results within a certain length of time here for example um, all, uh, until uh, until this time right they'll be available we could click on this and save it and it would return us to these results in the in the future it tells me the program I run blast then in this case the, the database I searched etc tells me that my input molecule was DNA okay or nucleotide it doesn't uh, discriminate it'll call it DNA depending on regardless of where it comes from and it has 468 characters in it 468 nucleotides in this case and then the heart of this results the actual the, the meat of it starts there's uh, four tabs here there's a description tab and a little summary tab and an alignments tab and then a taxonomy tab by default the description should be open and this is the hits that we get so these are the top ranked um, things that were found in the database that are similar to our query sequence and in our next week's class we're going to talk about of course how the algorithm works how it identify these things how, how uh, the programming underneath this works and we'll talk about each of these statistics these numbers that are presented after each one of these hits now the score that's a measure of how well these things align we'll, we'll talk in great detail how to calculate this there's another column called coverage so what that means is of our query sequence and it was let's see how many characters long it was you know it was 460 odd characters long 468 characters long it means this first hit span all of those characters a hundred percent of those characters were covered in the alignment now if the query coverage is only 50 percent it would mean that only 200 odd characters 230 odd characters were alignable to this hit because that's it's the percentage of that input query sequence that feature in the resulting alignment so higher numbers are better it means more of our query is covered okay then we have an e-value and we'll come back to that next week it's a very important parameter it tells you about uh, how trustworthy these results basically the statistical significance of the result of the alignment score another way to think of it is how likely is this thing to be gobbledygook or random old crap right so we'll come back and describe the e-value in detail next week and then we have our percent identity this means of the characters that were aligned how many of them are exactly the same character as our query sequence in this case it's really good it's not 100% it didn't get every answer correct so there are some differences that we'll see in a minute 
so but it's pretty close pretty damn close and then we have an accession number this is the the little tag for this sequence in the database if you wanted to go find it so there's the first one and it's, it's hemoglobin subunit beta hbb messenger rna and then we have some from pan pan paniscus so these are chimps and uh, pygmy chimps and, uh, and then various other uh, humanoid species right it's homo sapiens blah 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 beta globins right so the question let's let's see what the question asked us in the in the workbook again so i'm going to click back here it says what are the names and accession numbers of the top four hits from your blast search well the accession numbers are over here and um so i could take these these accession numbers and copy them and paste them in so these are the ones that i found and this is uh, beta globin from human or hbb and so i would what i suggest here is you just write the four accession numbers i'll do the first two but the question is actually asking for four so if you ask put all four in you'll get all the points so here's another one and then etc well let's just do it so you notice some of these accession numbers have this format like nm underscore or xm underscore so the m means they're transcripts you know think of them like messenger rna if it was p it would be protein you know like np protein and the x and the n are telling us whether they're coming from RefSeq or actually not from RefSeq. In this case, X means they're kind of predicted sequences, predicted computationally. But the N, M are the good ones, the ones we really want. So let's leave it there for, for now for those sequences and say, what are the percent identities for the top few hits? Well, they're all 99%. So here I would write here 99.5 five seven to ninety nine point three six percent so very high identity again sequence identity means well we'll see it in a second what it means if we click on one of these let's click on the top one so homo sapiens beta globin i'm going to click on this what it does here is it actually opens the alignments tab you see this tab the third tab it just takes us to that tab so if you want to go back to the descriptions again we'll not use our back button but we'll just take our mouse and click on that tab instead that will be a, a better way to drive this thing so this is the alignment that's shown here between our queries that was the thing we searched with our patient sequence that we started with from our workbook and underneath it stacked underneath it is the sequence from the database okay and it tells us some of those same statistics up above here it tells you the accession number so you could click on it to go to that sequence entry in the in the database and we're in RefSeq in this case we know it's a RefSeq because it's nm entry it tells you the length of it etc so here it tells me again the e value but it's telling me a little bit more about that percent identity remember it was 99 percent identical it's actually telling me 466 of 468 let me see if i can if i can zoom in on that a little bit so you can see it so i'm just zooming in on that line it's telling me 466 of 468 characters in this case nucleotides are exactly the same and those are the ones below here that have the dashes between them. See, it's, whether it's an A, it's got a dash to the A below. So they're identical characters. Now, there, that means there are some that are missing. How many? Well, two, right? Six, seven, six, eight. So there's two characters that are different in this patient sequence and this database sequence. Where are they? Well, they're the ones without the dashes in them. I can see one right below where I'm zoomed in on here. I can see here this character there's a T in our query sequence and there's an A in our database sequence so this is a mutation or a substitution a patient 
specific mutation here in this in this case, right? And there's another one somewhere. If I uh, looked closely enough or had enough motivation to do it, I could see, oh, actually down here in this other region, if you can see where my, see where my mouse is. Let me see if I can use this pointer thing, if I can figure out how to, how to use this. Okay, so here's the second one down here. Okay, in this position. And the other one, the first one that we spotted previously was right here. See, there's a missing dash between these sequences here. So those are the two characters that are different. And the answer to the question in the workbook is 466. It asked you how many, let me zoom back out of this page. So here it asked in the workbook about the last reported hit. So if to get to the last reported hit, I'm gonna go back to my descriptions. I could keep scrolling down on the alignments page and it would load all the alignments for all these hundreds of, of hits. I'm just gonna scroll down to the bottom of this big list of all these things and click on the bottom one. So in this it says predicted uh, sequence. Predicted means it's inferred from a gene model done computationally. You see the accession number XM? If we zoom in here, you see this XM? This means the X here is telling us that it's one of these predicted. It's not an NM, it's not a reference sequence that's uh, backed up and, and, and uh, very trustworthy. But this one here is predicted, as the title says. So I'm gonna go click on it. It'll bring me to the alignment page for that sequence. And the, this one is less identical, less percent identity than the top one. So they're ranked, these lists are ranked, okay? Most similar at the top, and it goes on down and down and down and actually goes to these things get quite remote. So in this case, this has 400 of 439 uh, that feature in the, in the alignment. So the alignment's a little shorter, but there's only 400 identical compared to the higher number that we had above. So I would add these to my, my, uh, so it's 400 for, for last report. And this was, I'll copy this accession number just for reference. And I'll put in the top hit, I'll go back to the start here and, and, and add that. I'll go, uh, I could take this thing and scroll. I'm actually gonna use the back button, not follow my own advice. Well, maybe I should not try and break it live online. I'll just take the mouse and scroll all the way back to the top and find my top hit. Homo sapiens subunit the globe and this was 466. And I'll write this one. Copy this. And it was so 466 for our first. First, that means top hit. I'll paste that in. And 400. Identical positions, sorry, not 366, 466. Okay, so I've answered the first four questions here already. I've, I've got a little bit of an indication of um, how to start looking at some of these blast results. And we, we'll, we'll do more others. You'll see this graphics reports and others. And I encourage you to uh, have a play and look around. The next thing, that the workbook is asking us as well, what the hell is this thing? What does it do, right? And many of you will have heard of hemoglobin and beta globin before. Some of you mightn't, and that's that's absolutely fine. I picked it because it's a somewhat common gene that we we're, we're, <laughs> well, we definitely all have, but who we might uh, have heard about as well. So where you would go if we were doing this on you know something that we didn't know too much about, right? If we, if we find a hit that was some peculiar named enzyme that is a little bit obscure and that you know doesn't feature in textbooks and the like, which is you know most of the case cases that we actually deal with. That's 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 what happens, and we need to find out more about it. What do you do? Where do you find out more? 
Well, what I'm going to show you over here on the side of a given uh, uh, search result, here I'm on the top result again, I'm going to click where it says, see where it says related information over here? I'm going to click this link to the gene database. Let me use my, my pointer and see. So I'm pointing right up above my head here. I'm clicking on this related information. See it up here? The gene database. Okay, so I'm going to click on that. And eventually, as Netflix in the other room lets us get some bandwidth, we see we get to hemoglobin subunit beta. So this is the gene entry for this, uh, you guessed it, gene, right? So this is a, 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 an excellent place to go when you want to find out something or lots of things about something you don't really know too much about because it has lots of link outs. This, this NCBI database called gene uh, has lots of link outs to other resources, other databases that you can find out you know, about the drug ability, about the disease phenotypes that are known uh, for this particular gene, about its expression patterns, about all sort, sorts of stuff you might be interested in, including its function, of course, and, and where it is in the genome and, and these sorts of things. So the way we drive this page or the way we, we look at it is, you know, you it's big. If you see where the scroll bar is on this and this page, it's, it's a tiny little thing. So, you know, you could read from the start to the finish and then start to kind of hate your life as you get halfway through this thing or even before that. Um, the way to drive it is on this uh, navigation panel over on the, as, as you're looking at it over here on the right hand side of the page. So let's, let's before we click on this to answer the questions in the workbook, let's have a quick read. So the official symbol here, up here is, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, official symbol, that's you know what the world has agreed to call this gene, is HBB, and it's provided by the Human Genome Nomenclature Commission, that's what the HGNC is, that's the kind of uh, terminology police, right, that say, if you're talking about this gene, please call it that, right, so everyone knows that we're talking about the same thing, uh, that's not always the case, people often... Um, call the same thing different names. We're trying to get around that with this Human Genome Nomenclature Commission to standardize naming schemes. And its official full name is hemoglobin subunit beta, etc. And so there's lots of things here, you know, it's from the lineage where it is, right? It's in Homo sapiens and all these other uh, bits here in the summary. The alpha and the beta loci determine the structure of two types of polypeptide chain in adult hemoglobin. So there's an alpha globin and a beta globin that you might have heard about before. So, and we could keep reading. This is this text is a bit like the abstract of a published paper, right? So it's written by humans and humans, you know, can write well and they can write obscurely. It just depends. You know, this one's not too bad, right? So we could read all this. Now, the questions that are going to orient our exploration of this gene database are in the workbook. So, question five. What's the official symbol and official full name for this gene? Well, that's, I've just read that off, right, from the book, from the thing. It's HBB and hemoglobin subunit beta. HBB. And that's, let's just copy it in, because I'm lazy, I mean efficient. Okay, what chromosome location is this gene located on? Well, I've zoomed in here a little bit, but let me zoom out so I can see the, the, the nav bar over on the right-hand side. To answer this, I'm going to click on genomic context. That's the second link here that'll bring me just down below, actually not too far. I can already see it in the bottom of my screen, but right here, genomic context is where I'm going to click. So I'm going to click that. It scrolls me down, and it tells me here that this is on, the location is 11p15.4. What does this mean? Well, it means, this is kind of the old school geneticist way to talk about uh, genome location along a chromosome. It's on chromosome 11. Chromosomes have the, the arms, right, from the centromere, from that middle bit. Maybe I should pull up a picture of this in a second. But the P is the short arm of the chromosome. And then it's in band 15. 
that they're called chromosomes because they absorb lots of dye. You know, the, that first person that discovered them didn't really know what they had, but they soaked up dye like, like anything. And so they were called chromosomes, but they have this traditional kind of characteristic banding pattern uh, that we'll see. Let's pull up an image instead of me trying to describe this with my fingers and hands. So let's uh, open a tab and see chromosome. Uh, I'm just searching for chromosome structure banding pattern just to pull up some kind of image. So here, let's let's pick one. Uh, images. <laughs> so there's funny cartoon ones, but here's the. Let's pick this one. Chromosome banding pattern. So there's the P and the Q. This is someone's someone else's slide. It's going to load here. Eventually. Oh, it's a video. Just screw that. Let me just zoom in on one of these. Yeah, so here, chromosome banding pattern. So if I'm over here, so here's my P arm, the short arms of the chromosomes, all going from the centromere. The, the Q arm is the longer one. And then we've got our, these characteristic banding patterns here. And we are on, uh, and we just count these down to find where we are actually physically located on the chromosome. Okay, so that's a bit of a side note about what that means. Now, um, so we're in the fifth uh, chromosome 11, 15.4, and we've got three exons. Why do you think it doesn't list the number of introns here? Well, because there's an intron between every exon, so there should be two introns and three exons. Let's scroll down a little bit and we'll see this in this graphic region. So here is the genomic regions and transcript products. Here's the structure of this gene. So it's, this is the actual coordinates along chromosome 11. You can see there's numbers that are here like uh, 5,222,27,200. This is the coordinates that we kind of use now uh, because we have the sequence to go to rather than the banding pattern. And we can see here that there's uh, exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, and in between them, the thin lines are the introns. If we scroll down a little bit, we'd even see the RNA seq data where, th where these reads map to the exons, the protein coding regions. Exon 1, big peak, exon 2, big peak, exon 3, big peak. And the introns, 1, 2. Where I'm looking at is, let me make this more clear. Here's the exons, 1, 2, 3. And here's the introns and below it, 1, so I'll go to the start, 1, 2. And that's shown in this kind of uh, almost genome browser-like display. Now there's lots of other things here presented about the functional regions in this gene that we're going to ignore for now. We'll come back to these uh, what are called tracks when we get into our genomic segment of the course and we deal, uh, delve into genome browsers a little bit more. But this, this is the kind of information that's provided here. So there's three exons, it's on chromosome 11, two introns. I think we also ask about uh, this little re uh, graphic here, which is kind of small and, and, and not the most straightforward, but it's showing a simplified view of that region of chromosome 11. And the little red arrow right here, if you can see that, that's our hemoglobin beta. That's our gene that we're actually on here, right? So this is the, if I put my mouse over it and I'm patient enough, it would give a little pop-up that would tell me this is HPB. The other arrows here, it's telling me the way these genes are transcribed, which strand they're, they're being read from here. The other arrows are the neighboring genes. So for example, there's a HPD. If I went over this, it would tell me and if there was enough uh, scope for me to zoom in and see this, I'd like you to do it yourself. This is the little pop-up tells me this is hemoglobin 
subunit delta. And if you actually clicked on this, you would go to the gene entry. That's the same page that we're on now for the beta globin, but we'd go to the gene entry for that gene and you could find out more about it. So if these are the neighboring genes. There's other ones like this OR51V1. This is an olfactory receptor, family 51, subunit five member. So these neighboring genes, we'll list a few of them. There are uh, the answer to question seven. So what chromosome is it located on? Chromosome 11, neighboring genes, this HBD, and uh, the olfactory gene, you could write some others there. How many exons? Three exons and two introns. Okay. What's the function of the encoded gene? Well, you might know the function, right? We, we probably, many of you do. And we could read it from here, you know, mutant beta globin causes sickle cell anemia, it says here. Um, absence of beta chain causes these things called thalassemias. These are all diseases associated with this gene. We'll come back to that in a little minute. But this, as I've said uh, just a minute ago, this is like an abstract of a paper. It's, it's, uh, it's written by humans. What I suggest you do here is use this sidebar and click on gene ontology. That'll scroll you all the way down the page. We'll come back to talk about what gene ontology is in a moment. But this tells you about all the functions, the biological processes like oxygen transport and components. Where is it? Like it's in the blood, it's in the cytosol. So here we can see that this thing is involved in oxygen transport and a few other uh, functions as well, like renal absorption, platelet aggregation, blood clotting, all these sorts of things. It's involved in oxygen binding, uh, heme binding, that's a portion of this hemoglobin unit. What these things are, this ontology, it's a controlled vocabulary that we use to describe functions and processes and locations in this case. It's useful because humans all write differently uh, and these things are much easier for a computer to parse and understand if you use these controlled terms. So we'll come back to ontology and use it a lot when we go and analyze our own high throughput experiments later in the course, because we'll often want to get functional annotation for them. And rather than going and reading you know, tons of scientific papers, which of course is probably good for your soul, but not maybe good for your mental state sometimes, we can use this ontology to get a much more succinct and controlled way of describing uh, functions. So in this case, I'm going to write oxygen binding, heme binding, these sorts of things in this box. Uh, then finally, question 10, and then we'll take a well-deserved uh, break here. Does this protein have a role in human disease? Well, yes, I've already saw that, you know, this sickle cell disease that we'll find out more about, and these things called thalassemias. Where could we find this? In our gene entry, I'm going to go back all the way to the top of this page. And here I'm going to click on phenotypes. So back on my navigation menu, I'm going to click phenotypes. This will take me to a subsection of this website that deals with phenotypes, things like diseases that are associated with this thing. So here, this is alpha thalassemia, beta thalassemia, uh, fetal hemoglobin stuff, HBSS disease. This is our sickle cell disease. And so thalassemia, that comes from the, you know, the Greek word for uh, by the sea. It was often found around the Mediterranean countries. We could click on these and, and read about what thalassemias are, for example. And we'll see there's a number of databases that are linked out to here, like MedGen, Omen, this other one called Gene Reviews. So we could click on some of these and explore these diseases if you're, if you're so motivated. Let me click on one here, like the beta thalassemia. It brings up this Omen database. It says, it'll tell you all, beta thalassemias is characterized by a reduced production of hemoglobin, which results from reduced synthesis of beta globin chains relative to alpha globin chains. So, so this disease here would be mean there would be less beta globin around in a given, uh, given patient. Let me pick another one. Let's maybe pick this HBSS. I'm gonna click on that one. I'm opening it in a new tab. This OMIM database that's linked out to O-M-I-M stands for Online Mendelin Inheritance in Man, which is a little bit 
unfortunately named, right? Obviously, it means people, humans. It was an old um, encyclopedia, actually. It was a whole set of books that used to be distributed back in the back in the olden days to uh, clinicians around the country and indeed around the world that were interested in the genetic basis of different diseases for diagnosis and, and treatment. And it used to be shipped, these big, huge tombs of things, and it was called the Online Mendelin Inheritance of Man because that was a different time back then. And of course, uh, now it's an online database, uh, um, uh, partially supported by the NCBI, uh, but they haven't updated the name, unfortunately. It, it, they should, but, it, but it's not. So here I'm, I'm looking at sickle cell anemia. It tells me it's on chromosome 11, P15.4. This is our beta globin gene, right? There's our HBB gene, and we can get a, a description of it. Sickle cell anemia is a disease associated with episodes of acute illness, progressive organ damage, a hemoglobin polymerization leading to the rigidity and the malfunction of these red blood cells. So we can read all about uh, the clinical features, the description, and then you know, link out to animal models and cell lines and things that we might want to use to study uh, this disease and, and treatments for it, of course, if, if that's the way you want to go. But by this stage, what, what I'm going to do here is we're going to come back to these kind of resources. There's a wealth of information here, but we're going to uh, limit ourselves now for section one and, uh, and say that, uh, yes, we have sickle cell anemia. So we're going to paste that in and both and, uh, and, and beta thalassemia. Now I've got that open here as well as as well as some others. As long as you list these major ones, we'll get the we'll get the points. Okay, so let's uh, take a break here. That took a little bit um, longer than I was expecting because I'm answering the questions for you. So maybe in section two we'll go a little bit. Um, we'll take a different uh, different <laughs> approach, and I'll not answer them all for you. But we'll we'll also just highlight the major learning goals in, in these things rather than me talking at you for so long. But let's take a little break now. It's on my clock. It's ten. Uh, 48 so let's take a little break I'll pop over to um, to our Piazza site and see if there's any questions let me see if I can add a comment here so how are we doing for for speed any questions that they, that have not been answered Piazza. So I'm going to go have a look. Let me go back here. Oh, I'm not signed in because I need to be a different browser.
So, okay. So, not much activity. Oh, there's someone in the comments on YouTube. Sorry. What did the NCNPNM mean in the genomic region section in the NCBI database? Oh, in the, in the genomic region, uh, it's going to be the chromosome ID for the NC. NP is going to be the protein ID, and NM is the, the messenger RNA ID. So they're used to differentiate different types of information. C is for chromosome, P is for protein, and M. Just think of it for um, messenger RNA. Okay, and then there was a question saying um, how many examples do we insert in the worksheet if it isn't specified in order to get credit? As many as you can is the answer. So give at least, um, if it asks for a specific number, like four, give four. If it says how many neighboring genes are there, as long as you give uh, two or three, you'll get the credit. Let me be, let me be exact, as long as you give uh, two, one either side. So for example, I wrote, the delta globin and the olfactory receptor, and I would give myself full credit for that. Okay. All right. So let's um, hold on for a second and see how we're doing. This might be a little peculiar. Okay, I'm still still alive. Okay, so it's still working. Okay, let's turn that off. Okay, let's have a look and keep going and we'll get into Section two. Okay, so let me go over here. Okay, so by now you should. Oh, one more question from Alina coming in. So I almost escaped, but let me let me go back and. And see if I can read that question. It says, what if I got two ranges of the same gene that was aligned to the sequence provided? Does that still count as being identical? Uh, let me try and read that question again to see. What if I got two ranges of the same gene that was aligned? Okay, so that, that means if there's, so we have our, our query sequence, like my, let me try and show it here, like my pen, right, comes in and we'll have an, another something in the database that's found to it, like this pen lid that aligns here, but then we might have something else that comes in and aligns over here, so there'd be none overlapping, two different ranges. And now if they're the same thing, that means there are two fragments that map to this, so there are two local alignments in this region, and we're going to talk about what these local alignments are and what the statistics mean in the next week's class? And the answer is yes, they do count. So if you're searching for a gene, this will happen uh, quite often when you search with longer sequences that maybe have multiple domains or multiple functional units in them, you'll get matches to both both parts, okay? Does it still count as being identical? Well, it's identical in the sense that the identity, the number of the characters the number of amino acids, or in this case, nucleotides that match, you would still calculate them as a proportion of the, the bits that are aligned. Yeah, does that answer the, the question? It says it's on Piazza, so I'd have to go back to Piazza to make sure.
Okay. Right. I'm going to leave that unresolved. <gasps> no. Why is it unresolved? Okay. It's it's difficult to know in this in this form. Maybe if we can't uh, direct it uh, with a good answer right here, what we should do is in our office hours that follows, where we have our Zoom conversation, we can talk about it, and I can plug in a whiteboard and try and sketch it, sketch it out what this means if we have the two fragments matching. Okay. What if I got two ranges? Okay, so no more follow up. Let me go um, go back to our section. So section two. So by now, um, we should be aware that there are uh, a couple of diseases associated with this uh, with this gene, this beta globin gene, including these thalassemias, but also the sickle cell disease. And in the longer hands-on worksheet that we would do in class, we would talk a little bit about the clinical symptoms of the patient, and we would read the omen uh, descriptions and, and see which one matched best. I've kind of removed that from this workbook just for time and for uh, uh, for our own kind of uh, pain threshold here via this online instruction method. But in essence, what we're after is one of these two diseases and we're going to arrive at the sickle cell disease. The patient was African-American, had chronic uh, shortness of breath, described it like a like an elephant sitting on their chest, you know, this horrible uh, pain in, in, in their various uh, various cases. You know, it's just an horrific uh, thing to, to, to suffer from. Okay, so let's go and find out a little bit more about this patient in particular and find what is it that's different in this patient's beta globin versus the conventional, the, 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 the kind of reference beta globin that's in most folks. So to do that, we're going to go and find uh, a regular beta globin sequence to compare to this patient sequence that we've got. Okay, so I'm gonna go to, and follow these instructions, I'm gonna go and open up NCBI homepage. This is the web address, so I'll just click on it. And this should open a new tab in my web browser that's at the NCBI uh, homepage. And up here in the search box, the search bar up here, this is uh, a bit like, well, it's called the Entrez search. That's where the NCBI name it. It searches across all databases by default. You see this drop down menu says all databases. If I just searched HBB, that was the gene name that we had uh, discovered for this thing and just searched for this, it would search across PubMed and uh, bookcases and all sorts of other things. So here it says like, uh, so there's 113 books that I could go read about this. There's uh, uh, 5,000 odd manuscripts, publications I could read about that. That's not what I'm after. I want to focus myself a little bit on these things. So I'm gonna go back here and not say all databases, but say nucleotide, because I'm after a reference nucleotide sequence. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to do HBB and push return uh, or click the search button. And it's got this little helpful hint that says beta globin, subunit beta. And this is actually helpful. This is what I'm after. I'm after uh, RefSeq transcripts. In this case, I could. This is the one I want because I'm. Uh, you know, we have a transcript from our patient. That's what we want to compare to. It's not a not the protein. It's not the the gene page. So I'm going to click on the RefSeq transcripts. Now, if you didn't have this helpful hint, we'll talk maybe uh, in one of the videos about this. We could go and we could say, well, I'm interested in humans only please right i'm being biased here and i could click on humans this would limit my results to humans i could also go and uh, click over on this side where it says RefSeq. see RefSeq right here that would give me the reference sequence the the this subset of genbank that's uh, most representative but it's already got it in this hint so i'm going to go and click RefSeq transcripts right here and it gives me this homo sapien hemoglobin gene bank or gen bank 
entry for this thing. And it's RefSeq because it says NM. See this NM right here? This ID, this was one of the questions. So again, this is the one we're after. Okay. So, and this is the old school GenBank entry. It's got like the locust name, the accession number, the organism it's from, and, and you could scroll all the way down and you would see there's lots of journal references and these things and a, a comment and all and past these things like CDS, coding sequence. It goes from nucleotide 51 to 494 here, right? This, this, this kind of annotation here. There's an exon that goes from 1 to 142. Now this is fine and eventually you'll see uh, at the bottom there's a sequence. Somewhere down here, yeah, there's a, a, a sequence in this so-called GenBank format here. So most people don't enjoy reading this kind of uh, file format, but it's much easier to look at, and I'm going to scroll all the way back to the top, is this thing, the graphics. From it. You see that underneath here, there's there's two uh, links, one called FASTA, that's the FASTA sequence format, the simplest display of the sequence. That's the one we actually want. We'll, we'll go to that to copy it in a moment. I want to show you before then this graphics format, which will display exactly the same information that is here in this GenBank entry, but in a, in a you got it, graphical way. So let's click on that. And this will open eventually a um, little graphical viewer it's a bit like a genome browser in that you know the nucleotides are presented uh, longitudinally or across the page horizontally and we have our hbb uh, gene if i mouse over it it tells me it's the hbb gene it goes from one to six two eight it's 628 nucleotides in length then the little red bar where it says NP, remember the P means the protein? So this is the protein product. And you see it's not as long as the gene itself. It actually starts a little bit later and ends much earlier, this red bar that I've put my mouse over. And on the pop-up box, it may be too small for you to read on your screen, but it tells me the location of this CDS, the coding sequence. It goes from 51 to 494, I think that's one of the questions in the workbook. So it goes from nucleotide 51, so that means the first 50 uh, nucleotides, <laughs> I'll, I'll try and do this the right way, the first 50 nucleotides don't make it into protein, right? they're an uncoding region. And of course there's exons and, and introns, so the introns here are, are, aren't visible. As you see here, exon one, if you can see where my mouse is down here, exon one, it goes from one to 142, I can mouse over exon two, it tells me it goes from 143 to 365. It's 223 nucleotides long. The introns are spliced out. And then finally, exon 3. It goes from uh, nucleotide 366 to 628. Okay. So this kind of information is also shown in the gen, but that uh, kind of ugly plain text thing that we saw first. This uh, web page just renders it into this little graphic. So either way, whichever way you want to get it, you'll find the, the positions of the exons, the, the coding sequence, either from the GenBank entry or this graphical entry. So that, that can help answer some of those questions. You know, what's, the, what's the accession number? Well, that's the thing up at the top, this NM058. So we've put that in here. And we've already got to it, rather helpful hint. What are the numbers of the first and last base position of exon one? Well, that was, if I mouse over here, this was one to 142. Oh, what are the numbers of the first and last base position of the coding sequence? That was the red one, the CDS. So that's 51 to 494. If I wanted to get this from that old school entry, the GenBank entry, I would click on the GenBank entry and wait for it to load. And I could do find in page, you know, control F or command F and look for CDS. It says here, CDS, that tells me the same data. I see 51 to 494 right here. 
just the same thing that was um, rendered up in the, the graphic image. Now what I need for the next sections or for this main section is I need the sequence. You know, show me the money, right? Show me the sequence. So I'm not going to use this gem bank entry or the graphics entry. I'm going to use the FASTA entry, right? So I'm going to click FASTA here in this link. And what I get is the FASTA sequence entry. See, it looks very like the, well, in terms of format, it looks very like the one that you were provided with in our workbook that we started with in our PDF. It's got that little more than symbol and a name. Let me zoom in here. So here it is. This is the, the, the thing. And then after that, um, uh, identifier for this sequence or name for this sequence. There can be any plain text, any kind of annotation that you want to add. The most bioinformatics programs will just ignore this annotation. Uh, in fact, nearly all of them ignore it. They'll take the name and then they'll go to the line underneath and that's where the good stuff starts. That's the sequence. Okay, so we want to take this whole thing and make sure, please, to take the identifier line. I'm going to take all of this. Let me zoom out so I can make sure I'm getting it all. So I'm going to copy all of this right down to the bottom and I'm going to control C or command C it to put it on my clipboard. And I'm going to take that together with the one provided in our workbook and compare them. And to compare them, I'm going to use a, a tool over at the European Biofmax Institute. We're going to jump over to the, to the EBI. Okay, so here we're going to get into section three and use this tool called Muscle. So I'm going to click here. This will open up the EBI website that's shown here. You see it says up at the top, EMBL EBI. So this is the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. EBI stands for European Bioinformatics Institute. And it's got a form again where we can use this, t this tool, in this case called Muscle. So I'm going to paste that sequence that first one from, uh, from that we got on the on the web page just a moment ago, and I'm going to put a return carriage. So I'm going to give it a new line, and I'm going to go to my workbook and paste in the patient sequence. Remember the sequence that was in our right at the start. So I'm going to go back to my my preview. I'm going to take my workbook and go back to the start and copy this. Make sure you get the identifier line, that line with the the um, the little more than symbol in it, please. Okay, because this is how the Bafmax program will know that there's two sequences. If you don't include it, it'll think it's just one big long sequence and go, Bleh, I don't know what to do with this. Right, I can't compare one thing. I need two or more to compare. So I'm gonna make sure I paste it in correctly. You can always. Uh, drag this window down to make sure you've pasted it in correctly. So this is what your input to this program should look like. If it doesn't look like this, it ain't going to work. Okay. So the Banff Managed Program again will say, oh, I've got a sequence. Okay, boss. Here's the first sequence. I'm going to take the characters from here to here. And then it'll hit this little more than someone go, oh, a new sequence. Okay. And then I'll take this one. So once you've got that in correctly, we can go and click submit down here on this page and it'll take a second to think about it and then it'll give a window back saying your job is currently running please be patient and where this job is running of course is over in uh, over in the UK and it should take not too long to give us a result an alignment and that's what's shown here so it's taken the two input sequences, remember the, the, the name of the first one from the database was this NM00518.5, uh, it means the fifth version of this sequence. And then example one, that was our patient sequence. And it's aligned them. And again, we're gonna talk in detail about alignments and how they work, but the this program has added these gap characters, these dashes at the start. Uh, to kind of pad it out to make to pull out the, the most number of matches the the aligned signals so there are 
quite a few of those, and then our alignment starts. And anywhere where there's an identical character, if I zoom in here a little bit, you'll see here, these are identical characters. They have a star underneath them, like it's an A with an A. It's, it's an identical uh, match, T with a T, etc., etc. Now, somewhere in here, there's differences. So if your eyes were, uh, were good and you could look at this, you might uh, be patient enough to find one. Here's this T with an A right here. Let me use my highlighter to highlight this. So right here, we're missing a, a star here, right? So this means it's a non-identical or a mutation. This is our patient mutation. And if we remember back, we got our blast results. There were two. There's probably another one somewhere. If I was patient enough to look for it, I would find it. But this position is the one that we're, that we're after. We want to know, well, what does this does this mean, right? Is this mutation important? Will it affect the protein product of this gene, first of all, right? And well, we should look to see if there's another one. And with our eyes, we can see maybe down here, there is another one missing in these other positions. So if you were nerdy enough, uh, you would know that, or, or you, if you just counted that each one of these lines is 60 characters long. Okay, so it's you know, 60, 120, et cetera, they'll end it. So this C at the top, that would be position 120, uh, 60. And we could count along, we could say 61, 60, well, 61, well, okay, I'm not gonna do it, I'm getting tired of this. So 61, 62, 63, 64, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's actually, um, position 70 in the alignment. So if we start at position one at the top there, I'm kind of here, position 70 in this alignment is a mutation, this A for T. And the kind of question as always is, well, so what? Does that mean anything? Should we care about that? Does biology care about that? Let's find out. So uh, we want to figure this out. Oh, oh yeah, so we'll go back to section three where we're working. Now, and we could count it up and do these things. I'm going to suggest we do this in a, a, a different program called C View that we can that we can open this result file in and maybe check this out. So to do this, let's go and download this program called C View. This is a, a multiple alignment viewer program. And while uh, this web page is open, and I see there's a question that's come in that I'll, that I'll try and answer here. It says, uh, Alina is asking, what is the advantage of using muscle to using blast? So, there, so the question is relating blast versus muscle. So in, in these two programs are different in that the blast is a, is a tool for searching databases and it does what's called pairwise alignment. Muscle is not for searching databases. It won't find anything for you. You provide input to it that's curated and, and uh, we know about, for example, this reference sequence of what a real uh, healthy beta globin looks like and this patient sequence, and it'll do alignment in the targeted way. And it'll also do multiple alignment. If we give it many, many more sequences, like those sequences from, from chimpanzees and orangutans and all these other ones, it would align them all up one underneath the other. So the big advantage of muscle is that it's a multiple sequence alignment program. It's not a pairwise alignment program for doing database searching. So there, there are different purposes. They have different uh, jobs to do. One is to go searching uh, and find things that are interesting and then we'll take those results and often do a muscle alignment on them after because it will do a, a better job of that kind of alignment and show us uh, more details when we want to compare just more than two things. Remember in that blast result, like if we still have one open, here, these alignments were all query versus subject, query versus subject, query versus subject. In muscle, we can have lots and lots of sequences all compared together, all in one result. In, in our case, we're just doing it for pairwise alignment, but it gives you this format that we can take and put into uh, all the tools that we would use to analyze you know, families of sequences, these sorts of things. And that includes CView. So, Depending on the type of computer you're on, I'm on a on a on a, a Macintosh or a Mac computer. I'm going to click this one. If you're on a Windows one, uh, click the Windows one, of course, or Linux. 
you know what to do here. So this will give you a download. I'm, I'm going to do this on Windows. The download is, you know, the usual walk through, say next, 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 yes. And then once you've got that, I'm going to, so I'll click on it here too. Uh, do you want to download this? I'll say allow, yes, thank you. And that will go off to my downloads folder eventually when it's finished. And I can open on Mac, I'll just open the CV program from there. On Windows, you'll have an executable that you'll that you'll get from the start menu, and we can open that up once it's finished. So I'm going to take a second while that's uh, setting up to go back to the muscle page and download this file. See, there's a big button here that says download alignment file. We want to get this onto our computer so we can open it in the CV program to view it in a little bit more detail. So on my web browser, uh, some web browsers, you just click on this, it'll just download a file to your downloads automatically for you. On my web browser, I think it does that. Let's No, it doesn't. It's not smart enough. What it does is it just opens the thing that I wanted to download in a new tab. This is a text file that's just opened in the web browser tab. So to actually get this on my computer, I have an extra step to do. So I, let, let me do that again so people, uh, I didn't go too fast. I click download alignment file didn't download it for me, it just opened it in a new tab. So what I need to do is go up to the file menu of my of my web browser interface and say, please save this uh, file. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm gonna go up to and my web browser and say, save as, and this will pull up the menu where I'm gonna make sure this says page source. I'm just gonna put it in my downloads and I'm gonna call it, um, HBB, SS, anything. You can call it whatever you want, you know, alignment, week two. The extension of the file shouldn't matter too much, but I'm gonna call it CLW, because this is what's called clustal format. This is a, a, a particular format that was um, developed for another program called clustal alignment program back in the day by Des Higgins back in, back in Ireland. So here we're gonna take this CLW, save it, and put it in our downloads folder as long as you know where it went it should be fine for you now i should have c view i'm going to open i'm going to open that up and i see uh, c view perhaps let's see maybe i have to drag that so here's in my downloads folder i have the c view program that i can just open I'm going to say yes, please open. And this opens, although it's opened in a different window, I'm going to uh, drag that right here. So this opens this program. It's called CV units a little bit. It's a little bit, uh, <laughs> you know, not very pretty at the minute, but it says drag an alignment file or something here. I could drag it from my from my Windows, you know, my File Explorer or my Finder window on a Mac, or I can do File, Open, and open that thing that we downloaded from the EBI. So I'm gonna go and do that. I'm gonna do File, Open, and then navigate to my Downloads folder and open this HBB SS CLW file. And when I open it, it should display the two sequences here, and they're teeny, tiny on this window. So I'm gonna try and make them a little bigger just for your benefit of watching this. So I'm gonna do properties, font size, and bump it up to, let's bump it up to like nearly the max, 32. So hopefully you should see here, let me move it away from my head. Okay, so you should see the sequences. There's the NM, that was the, the sequence we got from RefSeq. And then there's the example one, that's the sequence that we got from our patient. And just like we show what was shown online on the web page underneath, we can see that there were a lot of gaps inserted. I can take my mouse, and the reason you know th these programs like CView, they're useful when you do have large alignments with many, many sequences in them because you can start to see patterns of conservation. 
those patterns of conservation are often indicative of functional regions in these molecules, like the site that does some chemistry, the active site of an enzyme, or if it's nucleotide sequences. The transcription factor binding sites or other functional sites are often conserved over evolution. In our case, these sequences are mostly the same, right? so it's not as easy to view, and we've only got two of them, not thousands or hundreds of them like we normally have. So it's less kind of informative, but what I'm going to do here is just use this program as a dumb counter. I'm just going to use my mouse and say, well, where is that first character? So I took my mouse and I just clicked on the first character here where we don't have gaps. And it tells me, let me uh, use my highlighter here, it tells me that this is position 51. See this, this thing right here? It says 51, so that means it's 51 characters from the first one of the alignment. Uh, and then it's number one, it's the first nucleotide of that example one sequence. If we went up and clicked on the one above, it would be 51, 51. See, it says if I've clicked on now the first sequence and it tells me 51, 51. So it's the 51th position in the alignment and it's also the 51st a character or nucleotide in this sequence, this NM00518. I'm gonna click again on the second sequence and it tells me, yep, still column 51, but this is in this example one, the patient sequence, number one. So what I want to do is again find uh, with my eyes where those uh, sequences, where those sequences differ. So I'm going to take the scroll bar and scroll along. And the color scheme isn't the most helpful here, but what I see with my eyes is there is a um, uh, uh, site that's different. This is this A with a T here, right here. So I'm going to click on that, and I've clicked on it in my example one sequence, and it tells me, just like I counted up before in that laborious way, it was position 70 in the alignment, so it's 70 from the start, and it's number 20 in this example one sequence. That's our patient sequence. And then there's another one somewhere. So I'm going to write this down for myself. I'll take a note of it. I've got a pen here and a piece of paper somewhere, a scrap of paper. So it's position 70, number 20. So it's the 20th nucleotide in our patient sequence. And then I'm going to scroll along and see if I can find, um, see if I can find the other one here somewhere. And here it is. It's number 162. So I've found it right here. So this is position 212 in the alignment, but 162 is the number I'm after. So I'm going to write that down as well. 162. And then the question is, well, you know, so what? What's the big deal, right? What does this matter? Should we care about either of these two positions? Let me go back to the go back to the start. Here and scroll along. So like this one, right, this first one. Does it make a difference? Well, to answer this, we have to think about, you know, what is the functional unit of this gene? It's the protein that's produced, right? It's this beta globin uh, protein that comes from this gene and that goes together with alpha globin to form hemoglobin that carries oxygen around the blood, uh, or car sorry, carries oxygen around the body right in these red blood cells these erythrocytes so does this affect the protein product so what do we know about um, about that that, uh, that that translation okay so we need we know about codons right this every three uh, nucleotides form a codon that can code a, a coded amino acid so in the workbook if we go back to it, I give you this little codon usage table so we could see, for example, the first codon, A, T, G, here, and we could look it up. A, T, G, what does that uh, uh, do? Well, A, the U means the, the T here, this, this, you know, for, for, um, for, for the table that we have, we have the first base position, the second base position, the third base position, so we're going to look at A. And then the U would mean the, the T. So this is a methionine. This is our start codon. So the first amino acid of this gene is the methionine. That will often be you know, post-translationally removed. You know, methionine is often the first uh, 
amino acid of these genes and it's often cleaved off these things. Let's see what the second one is. So that's methionine. Then we've got DTG. So we've gone, uh, it's uh, G, GTG. So that would be GTG. That would be a valine would be the second amino acid. So we, we, we get the idea. So this is how we were translating it into protein. Now, does this mutation in our patient, does it affect the amino acid encoded here? What about that other mutation? Does it, you know, keep doing this? You know, I wrote down 20, so 20 divided by three, you know, well, uh, three times six, I know, one. So uh, 20 divided by three is like 6 or something like that, right? So it's not a, it's not a whole number. So it means it's not in that third position because we would be going, excuse me, we'd be going three, six, get the idea, nine, et cetera, right? All the way up. So this would be position 21 and three, seven is 21. So this would be the seventh What is the mutant? Well, it's in the second position, so it's a GTG. So GTG, so it's over here, it's a valine. So it means it does affect the amino acid produced. It actually changes it from an E to a V, right? So there's a substitution at the nucleotide level that results in a change of the encoded amino acid in the protein. And then the question is, well, so what? You know, is that a big deal? Well, it turns out this one is a big deal. We'll, we'll find out about it in a minute. Now, so I'm going to write that down. So this was, uh, this is going to be in the second position of the codon because it's it's you know it's not it's in that 21 between 18 between 19 19 20 21 would be the codon. So it's the second position which affects the amino acid produced. Now the other one I wrote down was 162. Uh, that was the position when I clicked in CV. And that is a whole number, right? So if I divide it by three, that would be like 54, three times, yeah. Yeah, so that means it's in the third position, which is the silent position. It's not gonna affect, let's go check. I have to look up to find the scroll bar. So that would be, um, here it is. So this would be 162. So the codon would be G, C, A, or G, C, T. And I go to my table, so G, C, A, or G, C, T, it's an alanine. And it's an alanine regardless of that mutation. So it's a silent mutation on the protein level. So it doesn't affect the amino acid, it's still an alanine. There's a way we could do this in C view, you know, rather than doing that math, if you're not comfortable with this math, just division, we can do properties. I think if we do allow seek addition, well, you see here it says view as proteins. This is not going to be that helpful because they're out of reference, right? You know, it doesn't start at the start of the, the coding. So if I do this, it changes it to amino acids, but it's wrong. The program isn't sensible enough to do that. So let me turn that off for a second. I could do it if I, um, excuse me for, sorry if you're looking at my nose. Here, I could do it by doing properties uh, allow seek editing and then I could click here and then I could just delete oops that's not what I wanted to do so I need to select both sequences here and then I could do delete so I'm going to delete them all the way back to the start you don't have to do this you know the math does it quicker we'll actually see when we learn how to code and week after next that there's one line of code or two lines of code could answer this for us but we're kind of 
haven't learned that yet so we have to figure this and then if I do view by proteins I can see here's my mutation E for a V and this is methionine the first position that will be cleaved off so it will be position 7 minus 1 which is 6 so it's going to be an E to a V which is what we figured out manually as well I could go across and I can see that there's nothing in position 54 I don't even know where it is now it's somewhere else uh, in the sequence there's no other amino acid change in this thing okay so that's kind of a side note you don't have to do that in see view doing the math answers this question for us in the workbook so here it is how many gap characters were inserted that was 50 because the thing started at 51 what's the difference between the two amino acid sequences well uh, between the two sequences there are two positions uh, at, uh, two positions number 20 to 20 and 162 that differ and, I, and I've forgot to wrote down what those differences are but you should um, I think it was a G A it was the the A to a T here to T here and I forgot what the other one was but we could put it back and figure it out properties don't view as protein thank you and we could make sure so it was yeah the A to a T here position 20 and the other one wherever it was I've lost it because the color code's not very useful let me see yeah anyway wherever it is you can find it on your own it was somewhere it's a silent it's in the third position here it is beg your pardon it was a T for an A okay Which codons do they affect? So that's uh, it's going to be the seventh and the fifty-fourth. That's what we figured out. So we'd write that in. What amino acids do they uh, do? Well, it's going to be an E to a V at position seven or six when we. Leave the first one sign. Okay, so it's going to be uh, substitution E to a V at position six in the final protein, most likely. Okay, so let's stop here for a moment and then we're nearly home and dry, right? We're nearly at um, section four where we again ask, well, this E to a V, kind of so what, right? We've got a change in the amino acid, but what does it mean for the function of the protein, how this thing works? Kind of perturbation is it actually gonna gonna have so let me take a, a pause for a minute and see if there are any questions or anything that alina or or uh, Hanxing wants to draw my attention to or, or that you watching have and we'll, we'll figure this out So someone yeah, asked, go into the lab where you set my stuff. It's important that you download your PDF. I stressed that at the start of the video. You need to download it and save it as you go along. If you're doing it in your browser and you reload the page, you're screwed, right? Just like a web form. When you accidentally reload it, it's going to lose all your work. So that's why we have the PDF, so you can download it. Sorry. That must be painful. Okay, I don't see any other questions and I don't see any on the chat window. I'll just hold on for a second and see how we're doing. Just 
So let me ask in the chat. Any questions outstanding? One's related to this work. <laughs> okay. So we're on to, uh, you know, we're on to the last kind of section four here. This is the, the we're gonna um, go and look at the structural context of these things in, uh, in the PDB database. And we're gonna use this viewer called NGL. So let's finish up and we'll spend 15 minutes here doing the, doing the last section. There are same questions on Piazza. Same questions or some questions? Okay, and so I'm just reading the chat window. Let me go look. Some questions on Piazza. What's CDS's relationship to the gap characters filled? You tell me, right? I'm not gonna answer all the questions for you. What do you think? So the Gap characters at the start of the alignment, I've edited mine. How many gap characters were there at the start of the alignment? Let me uh, go back to the window here. And then there's another question about the PDF that I'll answer just in a second. So the, the, the alignment, when we did our alignment, I'm gonna go back here for a second. So let me, so this alignment had all these gap characters at the start. See all these things here? And there were a certain number of those. And our CDS started at, if I go back to my graphics window here, so it might be easier to see. See the way this CDS started at location 51. See the little pop-up? It doesn't cover the first 50 characters of the gene, right? What about that alignment? When does the thing start? How many gap characters do you think are there? Hint, it's the same. It's the same. It's 50. Okay. All right. I didn't tell you. Don't tell anyone I told you. Okay. No one saw me. It should be fine. It's not like we're online. Okay. Uh, there was another question that, that, I, uh, that I saw there about um, the PDF. So yeah, so when you download your PDF, please, this is important or else you're gonna, this is gonna be really painful. The thing uh, is, you know, we're on our class website, right? Let me, let me pull up a tab and go back to our, actually I'll do it here, class website. Um, Here we are in our class website. Um, we've got our our lab sheet here. Please make sure you download this. Okay, download it, download it, download it. So click here, download it. That'll give you a file on your downloads folder or wherever you normally download stuff. It's up to you to find it on your own computer. Open it like I've done here. Click in any of these boxes to enter in the text and then save, right? I'm gonna go and save my work now. So I'm gonna do file, save, or save as, whatever you wanna do, command S, control S, whatever, but save your work. So if I save, it's save my work with my answers, okay? Don't try and fill it in. You, know, you can fill stuff in on the web browser sometimes, like here I could start editing stuff, but the disadvantage here, you know, is, Okay, the, the disadvantage here is that uh, if you accidentally, you know, add some, some stuff in here and then you go and click a different web page, guess what happened? When you go back, that shit's gone. See? So don't live like that. Download it. 
it's almost like you have to follow the instructions like the things I say sometimes are important who, who would have thought it okay let's let's continue with the last uh, the last section so in this last uh, section section four we're going to go and answer this question the kind of so what question you know is does this thing actually matter right is there um, let me zoom in on the on the on the on the PDF here for a second does this um, does this actually make a difference to the function potentially uh, of this of this uh, protein so we could go to the main repository for biomolecular structures the called the PDB or protein data bank that's the database where all the results of uh, high resolution crystallography and NMR and increasingly cryo -M studies are going uh, and you could search for HBB and then go look at it this uh, that way you know we actually have the sequence the patient sequence here so we're going to use it we're going to use our good old friend blast and search against the PDB database at the NCBI website we can select uh, databases in there and we can search against the PDB but now there's something peculiar there in what I'm saying because I'm searching a PDB the protein data bank and the sequence we have up at the start so let me click on this link here, so here back to our you know blast website I'll, I'll do that now in a second but uh, uh, I'll load it but the sequence we have is nucleotides if I go all the way back to the start past all my answers let me just take the scroll bar and do it more quickly this is our ex this is our patient sequence I'm going to copy it again make sure I've got the right sequence on my clipboard and then I'm going to go back to my my uh, website when I've, and I've, and I've scrolled down to section 4 and I've clicked on this link here to open the NCBI website at blast and I've got a choice to make I'm actually going to pick a not nucleotide blast even though I'm searching with a nucleotide sequence because you see it says nucleotide to nucleotide I want to search a protein database with the nucleotide sequence so I'm going to pick this one in the middle which is called blast X what this does under the hood underneath does it all automatically for you it'll translate the nucleotide into a protein in all possible reference frames all six reference frames so you know starting with the different codon positions three this way through and then we'll do the the, the complement the, the other strand three that way so three plus three is six and it will search a protein database with all of those so I'm gonna click blast X and here I'm, so I'm making sure I'm on the blast X tab not blast N and I'm gonna paste in my sequence I'm gonna make sure it looks right by dragging my little text box over yep all looks good with the world in that case and here I'm going to make sure that I've got protein data bank not NR or RefSeq but protein data bank this is the PDB database I'm going to search the PDB database I could also in this case enter in human in here but I, I'm, I'm not going to bother if you know if there's other organism structures there that's that's fine we'll be able to look at it but we could limit ourselves to searching just in humans and I'm going to click blast so two steps there. make sure you have your patient sequence in the example one sequence in FASTA format and make sure you pick the blast database okay or sorry the blast the PDB database to uh, search against sorry so I have my search results it says I this time it says I used blast X see this uh, written here blast X and what I've got is search results against the PDB database you should see that up above uh, the database is PDB so if you don't if it doesn't say that then you've searched the wrong database and you won't have the answers that we need for this section so the top hit and actually they're very similar the first two hits 298 is the score so they both score the same they both have the pretty much similar values first one is GNB hemoglobin from homo sapiens that's that's us next one is chain B from homo sapiens and they've got two different accession numbers let me 
zoom in on this portion here at the end. Whoops, excuse me. Uh, hard to drive with one hand here. Okay, so of these top hits, I'm actually I actually like the second one better. And the reason I like the second one better, this one with the accession number one HBS, is because it's got 100% identity. And that means every character is the same. If I click on it and see the alignment, all the characters are going to be done. This means it is our patient sequence. It's our, the structure of our uh, sickle cell gene. So I could click on that and it would show me the alignment if I wasn't so zoomed in. And it would show me that 146 of 146 are the same. In this case, of course, it's smaller and it's protein. It's amino acids in this case, including this valine. See this valine here? See the, the where it starts? It doesn't have the methionine in it. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's our valine, our mutant valine. If we did this top one, it would be, uh, there's the E. See it? So this is not... 100% identical, it's 146 of 147. Okay, whereas here we have the feeling. So what we're going to do now, you know, we could click on this and go and look at the PDB database and find out uh, more about, about that. But given the time frame, what I'm gonna do is just go back to our, so one HBS is the answer here. I'm gonna go and uh, view this structure and talk about uh, where this feeling lies and see if we can find out what this feeling does to the structure. So this is in our in our uh, uh, workbook and it's kind of self-guided and I'm going to purposefully not spend too much time on this thing but I'm going to click on the NGL viewer link and let me just pull this out and add it to this page instead. Okay so this launch this black screen, right, which is a, a protein structure viewer, but it's online. So you might have used tools like PyMall or VMD or Chimera or something like that before, which are downloadable ones. Here, I didn't want you to have to download or install any particular software for this, but we are gonna use this online viewer, which has actually got quite a lot of functionality, but we're not gonna spend too long learning how to use it here because we're gonna use better things later, downloadable ones. So the first thing is I'm gonna uh, turn off this splash screen, this, this kind of thing that gives you some help page. So I'm gonna turn that off. So I'm at a, a, a blank black screen. I'm gonna to go to file up here at the top. And I'm going, to, I'm going to try and zoom in here a little bit. So I'm doing file. Actually, I shouldn't do that probably. File. And in this entry, I'm gonna do one HPS because that was the code that I found in the uh, in our search results, so I click return, and after a second or two, it opens this beautiful uh, molecular structure of hemoglobin. It's got alpha globin and beta globin, two alpha chains, two beta chains. If we went to the PDB database, we would see that. Actually, maybe we should do that for a second. Let me open a, a new tab and do search for one HBS on Google and this will take you to the PDB database no doubt. Here this is the refined crystal structure of hemoglobin and if we scroll down here this is the PDB database it would tell you that we have alpha chains these are uh, A, C, E and G and we have beta globin chains B, D, F and B, D, F and H because there's actually four copies of this thing. So let's go back to our viewer for a second. So this, by default, this NGL viewer shows what's called uh, the biological unit. We actually want to see what is present in the real crystal structure, not to simplify it the way this web browser uh, uh, does here. So I'm going to uh, change that display here uh, by clicking on the little hamburger menu, let me move this over slightly. This ham, the, the it's called the hamburger menu because it's meant to look a little bit like you know the two baps and the 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 burger in between, but it's just a three little extension menu. So I click here, 
and then under under assembly that's the third thing down instead of bu for biological unit i'm going to say au for asymmetric unit and this will actually show us what was in the crystal asymmetric unit the, the crystallographic structure that was there so this has added something to my screen you see this bluer uh, copy that's added here i'm going to center this by clicking the little uh, icon up here that looks like a target it's like the concentric circles up here. It's a center all, if you can see right up here. Unfortunately, I won't be able to zoom the page or because it will cause the web page to reload. So I'm going to click that. That'll center the center of mass that we can rotate around here. So, so we have two copies of this thing, two copies of hemoglobin, each with two chains of alpha and beta, just like the PDB database told us. Okay. And beta globin has an alpha globin has this heme group here. This chain here, the blue chain is one of these beta globin chains. Okay, and we want to now find where our position six, the valey, that that uh, results from this mutation from the from the from the e that was there before to a v in this mutant form. So we want to find out where that is. So I'm going to add a new representation. You can see each one of these kind of representations you can click on and off and it'll, it'll uh, display different, different things like here. I want to add a new representation to highlight that valey position. So I'm going to click on the hamburger menu again and I'm under these representation. I'm going to do add and then I'm going to click space fill. So let me show you that before I, I, I do it. Let me do that again. I'm going to pick this little hamburger menu and do representation. That's the second one down. I'm going to add this thing called space fill. And what's going to happen when I release it is every atom in this structure is going to go and be displayed as these balls, right? These space fill balls. And so in a second, when I let go, everything, well, it's a load of balls, right? There's a lot of balls on the screen and they're colored by the atom type, the element type. So this carbon here, which is this kind of gray color, this oxygen in red and nitrogen in blue. And everything is highlighted in these space fill, these balls. I don't want that. I only want a subset of, uh, I actually want just my valine to be in the space fill so I can see all the rest. So I'm going to click in the little box here and type that in. Now, if I'm going too fast, and I apologize, it's hard to see here on the, on the screencast, these windows, this is all shown in our uh, PDF. So if we're back on the PDF screen here, you can see here's, it tells you, um, it tells you where to click and where to enter. And so it's one HBS here. Here's the asymmetric unit that we set to. Here's the add and we have space fill and i'm going to type this in this position six and in the chain one of the beta globin chains i'm clicking the h chain here uh, i'm going to add that in and what will happen when i go back here what will happen let me go back to the, the web page underneath so i'm going to click here if i said six it'll just show position six in every chain okay uh, or if you did position 10, it would show position 10. I'm going to do colon, and for one chain only, that beta globin chain, chain H. So it's hard to see, but it's right in the middle of my display. I'm actually, just for uh, ease of view, I'm going to cheat a little bit and maybe make this a little larger. So can you see it getting a little larger here? And I'll maybe other also color it by... You don't have to do this, maybe resonate or something like that something a little bit brighter and vivid. So I've just made it a little bigger by changing the scale. If you don't want to do that, that's fine, as long as you can see where that position is. So this is the valine in this blue beta globin chain, and it sits right at the interface of these two copies of hemoglobin that are packed against each other in the, the crystal structure here that we're looking at. So what do we notice about it? Well, it's on the surface of one, but it's actually buried in the interface between the two copies. And so if we viewed the asymmetric unit in terms of the crystal and the lattice, this thing would go on and on and on and form these filaments. 
my hands are going off the screen, but it forms these filaments, right, that are characteristic of the sickle cell disease patients that actually end up distorting the erythrocyte, distorting the red blood cell, and leading to uh, leading to this kind of sickle shape that's characteristic under the microscope. So these form these long filaments, these polymers of repeating hemoglobin subunits, all because of this chain of valine. Now, if you don't remember anything or you haven't uh, covered amino acids and their characteristics, valine has a very different character than the residue it replaced, that charged uh, E residue or glut glutamic acid, which likes, it's called hydro hydrophilic, the, the original residue. It likes water, it likes to be on the surface of proteins. Valine is the opposite. It's hydrophobic, just like you know, arachnophobic. It hates water. It wants to be away from water as much as possible. It wants to be buried, and they're normally found in the interior of proteins. And that's what's happening here. This valine is trying to hide from water, and it's causing this clumping. It's like a sticky surface on the, that has now been inserted onto this beta globin chain that causes this clumping. It wants to be buried away from water, and this is driving this polymerization of these molecules that ends up leading to this sickle cell shape in our red blood cells. And here we have it right here. What else do we notice about it? Well, it's also, so it's coming from this blue chain, if we, if we turn it off for a second. So here it is, popping on and popping off. It's right beside this heme group, this prosthetic uh, ring here, this, this, this heme unit that actually binds the oxygen uh, in, in the neighboring molecule here. So it's also hindering oxygen uh, absorption and binding and transport by these hemoglobin molecules because it's going to affect the diffusion of oxygen to these units here. And this is beautiful work by Linus Pauling and, uh, and Max Perutz, of course, on the structural side and on the biochemical side that had these predictions and then showed that in these, in these structures and was very elegant work that this really does affect the oxygen carrying capacity of these molecules because of this location of where this is. It's in the vicinity of these heme units. It's also on the surface and causes this clumping and packing. Now, that's the kind of uh, conclusion or the end. I've gone a little quick here at the last section because of our, our time. We're approaching our kind of time limit here. But if you do have the, the motivation here, you, you, know, you can fill that in. What do you notice? It's on the surface. It's a hydrophobic residue and it's packed against its neighboring unit. Here would be the answer here. Uh, there's a discussion all in this book about this one HBS structure. There's also this YouTube video that you could watch. If you click on here, it'll launch this YouTube video. And if I have my sound on. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease that affects hemoglobin, the oxygen transport molecule in the blood. The disease gets its name from the shape of... Some red blood cells become sickle-shaped, and these elongated cells get stuck in small blood vessels so that parts of the body don't get the oxygen they need. Sickle cell anemia is caused by a single letter change in the DNA. This, in turn, alters one of the amino acids in the hemoglobin protein. Valine sits in a position where glutamic acid should be. The valine makes the hemoglobin molecules stick together when oxygen tension is low, forming long fibers that distort the shape of the red blood cells, and this brings on an attack. Okay, I apologize. I realize I didn't put the, the system sound on there, so you probably didn't hear that. But it walks through, you know, in a, in a very gentle introductory way, what, what's going on. And you know, what I uh, wanted to kind of stress, so you can watch that video on your own, it talks about the, the single nucleotide change that results in a single amino acid change. What I wanted to uh, mention here is that, you know, what we've done is we've gone from something we didn't know much about, a single sequence from a patient and gone all the way through by walking through these different major bioinformatics resource providers, we haven't touched a pipette, we haven't done any experiments, but we've just followed the trail like a detective through these different databases and went from something completely unknown at the sequence level all the way through to a very detailed molecular, like atomistic description of what could be happening, what could be going wrong in this, 
in this patient. And that's a really powerful approach, the kind of approach that you would want to apply to your research by using these sorts of uh, tools and databases. And we're going to get into the genomic side of things and, and the proteomic side of things as well as, this, uh, as these uh, kind of starting point resources at the NCBI and the EBI. So with that, what I really want you to do, please, uh, now or whenever you can, if you do click on this little muddy point assessment form, it'll bring you to a little Google form. And here you can tell me the things that were uh, not clear perhaps, or and give me a rating about uh, what you thought of this lab, how effective it was, and tell me, you know, do you want to go to Zoom instead? You know, the disadvantage there is we probably can't record all the students without their permission and make it available and so on. There are ways to do it, but we don't want to go down those sorts of routes. Anyway, let's, let's, let me know please what you think. And with that, I'm going to finish here and say the other thing that you're going to do once you've saved your sheet, you know, if you had all your answers in it, make sure, save, make sure you save your PDF sheet, then go to grade scope. I'll do it on this browser, for example, on Gradescope. I'm going to go here. And Alina added, uh, I'll just go to Gradescope, the homepage for this course. And Uh, if you haven't logged in before, enter in your UCSD email address and it'll ping you an email to set a password. If you have logged in uh, previously, it'll take you to this page, the landing page. And I only have one course here, so BIM143, it says one assignment. I'll click on that. And Gradescope, I already submitted my answers to this, uh, but you, if, you, you can always update them. As I'm going to do here, I'm going to say, uh, click on that, that link. I'm going to resubmit my answers, upload my PDF file or select file first of my class. I'm going to make sure this is the right one that has my answers in it. Yes, it says Barry, my student number 911. So I'm going to say, yeah, open that one, please, and upload it. And this will upload your lab sheet to successfully submitted. And it, then you should be able to see in Gradescope your answers. So you'll see a uh, student name, your PID number. You could click on any of these questions to see what you answered for question two, question three. And once these are graded, you'll see your points that you get for all these things. And you'll have, you'll have this for your reference for the, for the future as well, along with uh, the grading and the scores. Okay, it's just hit. 12 p.m. where I am, I realize there is a little bit of a delay on it, so I apologize for keeping you uh, longer. I am going to just do one final check of the Piazza Forum, and if there are no outstanding questions, I'm going to sign off there and say thank you very much. Thank you for the, the replies. And, and you know you don't have to post anonymously on the on the Piazza form. It's um, it's absolutely fine. There's you know there's no no problem asking any sorts of questions here. Uh, uh, it's often better if we know your name anyway, so we can follow up if if uh, anything needs followed up on. But thank you for your attention. I'm going to stop this live stream here and we'll uh, do one last little check that was our four sections let's finish up and say thank you thanks very much we did it we got there in the end thank you Hope you're all safe and well, folks. Stay happy, stay safe. That's the main thing. And uh, we'll see you next time.
Thank you. Bye.